Good afternoon. It is so wonderful to see everyone today. Um, there is nothing better than learning a poem with the poet or hearing an author talk about a book that they've written. The only thing I think that surpasses that is sitting with an artist and learning about his art. And that is the special, unique and rare treat that we have today. Uh, this is the, the second in our three-part series about the art of the Haggadah. And while Rabbi Matt Berkowitz is teaching the whole series, uh, today he is the teacher and the artist whose work will be our subject today. And there's just no greater joy than that. So I'm thrilled to be here and, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to share a little text with you, um, and then I'll share Matt's bio, and I want to share it in a special way so you know how tied we are to Temple Bethel. So we try to start each session with a text, um, just so we highlight a message that that um, that Rabbi Berkowitz wanted to accentuate. And so today, the text that we start with is an interpretation of the Shema and its surrounding blessings. The Kutzker Rebbe had an interpretation about the Shema, and he asked the question, why it says on your heart, instead of in your heart, that the words that you say at the time of the Shema, shouldn't they be inside your heart deeply? And the Kotzker Rebbe says, no, they need to be on your heart, in proximity of your heart. You may not at all times succeed at placing Torah within the Kotzker Rebbe teaches, but if you place the holy words upon the heart, there will be a moment when it breaks open at that holy instance, the Torah will fall in to be absorbed into the depths of a person's being. And if you think about this, why do we teach Shema and sing the Shema to little babies when they can barely absorb it? We keep it in proximity on their ears and on their hearts. So when they're ready to take those words in, they're familiar. I think it is the same with Passover and this time. Think about all the years we've sat through Seder. And maybe the words sunk in some years and other years, they were just there in proximity. We heard them, but we maybe didn't take them in. And then think about last year's Seder and how that was different for all of us than any other Seder in our life and how the words of the Haggadah penetrated in a way like no other. And so that is the beautiful text and sentiment we start with today. And I want to turn it to Matt because he is in proximity with us, as you've learned last week. He is a dear college friend of Rabbi Dan Levin. He is an incredible teacher. He's the director of Israel programs for the Jewish Theological Seminary of America and count founder of Kol Ha'ot, a Jerusalem-based venture devoted to exploring the arts and learning. He was a JTS Senior Rabbinic Fellow here in Florida, and we got to see him often. He's a member of the Wexner Heritage Program faculty. He's taught all over the country. He's a graduate like Rabbi Levin of Colgate. And he's ordained by JTS in 99, the same year I was ordained at HUC. And he is an incredible artist. We will learn a, particularly about um, a piece of his. But why I love the text that Matt chose for us to look at today and his presence with us is he is in our proximity. He's been in our building. He's dear friends. And his art hangs in our Judson Beit Midrash, this gorgeous structure that we've hardly had time to enjoy together. And so when you come back to the Judson Beit Midrash, and we're so thankful to the Judson family for endowing this beautiful space, rare and unique and beautiful, go to the corner where there is a booklet that details this beautiful Haggadah that Rabbi Berkowitz illustrated. It's a substantial, beautiful booklet. And now it's in proximity. We're still far away, but now the first time you walk back into Temple Bethel, I have a feeling that you are going to not just be in proximity, but enter into the Judson Beit Midrash and look up close and personal and have the artist, Matt Berkowitz, in your heart. So with that, Matt, we'll hit, Rabbi, we'll hand things over to you to get it started. Great. Thank you so much, Rabbi Mates. And uh, I want to begin on a note of Hakara Tatov, a note of appreciation um, to the entire Bethel community, uh, to Rabbi Levin, to Rabbi Mace, um, to Ross, who is behind the scenes uh, doing his magic. Without Ross, none of this would happen. Um, and I want to thank the entire staff at Bethel that has been so remarkable and so consummately professional every step of the way. 
So it is a great joy to be with you again uh, this week. And the learning, of course, will continue next week and, and even after that. Um, it has been um, just such a delight uh, to open with the Haggadah that in many ways inspired my own um, artistic journey, or I should say the journey of weaving together both art and Jewish learning. And what I wanna to talk to you about today from uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary Shokin Institute here in Jerusalem. I, I, I go out of my way to say that because I wanna remind you that your voices are being heard in Israel over this, uh, this hour that we're together. And especially in a time when you can't be here physically, uh, it's important to know that you're deeply connected to this very special place. And I'm delighted that um, I'm teaching from this place that has so, so much uh, history and in many ways influenced uh, uh, my work. Um, so what I want to do with you is I really want to give you um, a window, uh, a deep, profound window into the coming together of this very, very special project that I undertook, uh, to which I dedicated seven years of my life. Um, it was seven wonderful years, but I will tell you that uh, by the time I finished this journey, I was definitely ready for it uh, to wrap up. And part of what I love so much about teaching on the content of the Haggadah, both the visual aspect as well as the commentary, is hearing what others see when they look at uh, the pieces, when they look at the commentary, hearing how it is that, that you interpret it. So I certainly want to hear your voices over this hour. So let me begin at the beginning, how it is that this project came together. When I first began teaching for the Jewish Theological Seminary about uh, 20 years ago, uh, I was connected with um, a very, very special couple by the name of Didi and Steve Lovell. Um, I had the privilege of creating my own very, very unique rabbinate. The long and short of the story is uh, that my wife at the time beat me to the pulpit and I had a dream of, uh, being in the pulpit as well. We knew that we couldn't be in the pulpit at the same time. Um, and so she ended up giving me this gift of being able to tailor my rabbinate uh, to a very, very creative vision. And what I did is I approached then Chancellor Ismar Shorsh of the Jewish Theological Seminary at the time. And I said to him that I feel very, very passionate about adult learning and outreach. And I felt that it was tragic that when you looked at the map of the Jewish world, the only ones that were doing serious outreach, right, are the Orthodox, right? Chabad and Isha Torah and Or Sameach. And I said, where are we as conservative Jews, as reformed Jews, as reconstructionist Jews, we should be just as passionate about our message, getting it out there and, and teaching our people, our congregants. And to my great bracha, to my great blessing, uh, Chancellor Shorsh took this on as a mission and hired me as JTS's first senior rabbinic fellow to go out there and to teach to individuals, couples, uh, groups, tailored learning experiences, right, woven into Torah, wrote, woven into Mishnah philosophy, history, even into the Haggadah. And that is how I connected with Didi and Steve Lavelle. I was asked to go out um, and spend some time learning with, with Didi and Steve. We spent a year learning the philosophy of Abraham Joshua Heschel. And from there, uh, I presented Didi and Steve with my menu of, of topics. And they ended up choosing uh, the topic that I mentioned last week when we learned together, and that is the archaeology of the Passover Haggadah. Right? Why do I call it the archaeology of the Haggadah? Because when you think about the Haggadah, right, the Haggadah didn't come to us from one period of Jewish history but it came to us from many different periods of Jewish history. And just like we think of an archeological dig, that's how you have to approach the Haggadah. The Haggadah came to us from biblical, rabbinic, medieval, and modern times, right? And you sense all of those different levels as you read through the Haggadah on, on Seder night. So Didi, Steve, and I devoted um, a very, very intense year of learning in which we went through those different levels of the Haggadah. At the end of our year of learning, we were seated in their kitchen in Sands Point, Long Island, overlooking the water there. And um, Didi and Steve um, 
uh, came to me with um, a, a very, very curious idea. And they asked me if I would be willing to take on a commission for a new family Haggadah. Steve ran to his study with great excitement and pulled out about a dozen copies of the Haggadah that the family had been using for God knows how many years. And that was Mordechai Kaplan's new Haggadah published in the 1940s. Okay, some of you may be familiar with that Haggadah. I will tell you that every copy that Didi and Steve had was held together by electrical tape, wine stains everywhere, okay, as there should be in a good family Haggadah. And they began um, explaining to me that uh, Didi's father's Hebrew name was Pesach, and Steve's father was born on Pesach in 1908. And they decided that they wanted to commission a new family Haggadah in honor of the patriarchs of the family, the Kalik and, and uh, Lavelle families coming together. And they asked me if I'd be willing to take this on as a project. So we began talking and um, I agreed to, uh, we agreed to the, the, the terms of this project. The idea was to create a new Haggadah that we, would be substantive in Jewish art, that would be modern in its approach, it would take an egalitarian approach in its, in its commentary, and it would also be substantive in explanations, uh, bringing discussion questions, right, creative ideas to, to the Seder table. All of that was meant to be completed in one year's time, and I agreed. And I will tell you all, that I was delusional when I agreed to completing this in one year, because as soon as I began the work, uh, I realized that I was taking on um, a major, major project. Uh, I had difficulty multitasking. I didn't know what to begin with. Do I begin with the commentary? Do I begin with the art? Do I begin with the translation? And um, uh, after um, about six weeks of working on the project, I turned to Steve and I asked him if uh, they would allow me to simply immerse myself in the artwork of this project. And then after the artwork, I would go on to the next phase of commentary and then finally translation. And they graciously agreed to my request. Little did they know that it would take four and a half years to complete the artwork of this Haggadah. Remember, the entire project was supposed to be completed in, in, in one year. So they were uh, very, very generous, very, very patient with me uh, as the artwork began to unfold. And each time I completed an illumination, we would have an unveiling ceremony uh, in which you know, we would immerse ourselves in the artwork of, of that particular piece. Um, and that went on for four and a half years. At the four and a half year mark, I asked Didi and Steve for permission to come to Israel to create a limited edition collection of the artwork of this project, which we called Passover Landscapes, Illuminations on the Exodus. Um, and then two and a half years after completing the limited edition portfolio, we created uh, the trade edition of the Haggadah known as the Lovell Haggadah, right? This is uh, the Haggadah. It is named after Didi and Steve. I want you to know uh, that I had to twist their arms to name the Haggadah after them. They fought me, they were kicking and screaming, um, and I really, really pushed them. And I pushed them because of the kind of people that they are. Um, they are very, very kind, sweet, generous, modest people, um, very, very soft-spoken, um, uh, deeply thoughtful, articulate. Um, and I explained to them that there was a long tradition in the Hebrew manuscript world of patrons commissioning Haggadot from artists, from calligraphers. Um, and um, I said you know, to them that they were giving birth to this very, very special project. And ultimately, um, as far as I'm concerned, thank God that they agreed, and I'm delighted that Haggadah is named after them. So what I want to do with you now over the balance of our, our session is I want to take you through uh, the archaeology of the artwork of this Haggadah um, so you can understand some of the insights. Definitely 
The artwork is meant to spark conversation Seder night. That is part of what I wanted to do. That is part of one of the goals. So I'm going to take you on a journey through these illuminations. Uh, we are going to start, we're going to stop at a midway point so I can take some questions, comments. We're a small enough group. The truth is that you're welcome to pipe up or put questions in the chat and we'll stop at strategic points so I can address them. Um, let me pull up my share screen and the images themselves. Okay, and here we are. Okay, now that I've spoken about Didi and Steve, um, you've got to meet Didi and Steve in person. You should know that they're neighbors of yours. This picture was taken uh, at their home in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, and it was taken immediately after the trade edition came out. Um, you can see how happy the three of us are uh, having waited seven years uh, for um, this very, very special piece. Okay, the opening illumination of the Haggadah is a paper cut. Okay, and this paper cut is inspired by Parshat Kitavo from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 26. Why did I open my Haggadah with this particular image and why did I wanna to turn to Deuteronomy 26 uh, for, uh, uh, for the, the gateway into the Haggadah? The reason I turn there is because the rabbis use that particular text, Deuteronomy chapter 26, as the core section of the Magid, of the Haggadah, right? When we tell the story, that is what they base the entire story on, right? My ancestor was a wandering Aramean. He went down to Egypt, few in number, right? That is precisely where the story comes from. In the Torah, it's in the context of narrating the mitzvah of Hava'at Bikurim, of the bringing of the first fruits. The Israelite is told to take the first fruits once we're settled in the land of Israel. Those fruits are taken from the seven species of the land of Israel, wheat, barley, dates, pomegranates, etc. right? You see those seven species woven around this entire piece. That's what you see in the frame of the illumination, right? They're also sitting in the basket. The Israelite is told to put the fruits in the basket, take them to the temple, present them before the Kohen, before the priest, and then the Israelite makes a declaration and says, my ancestor was a wandering Aramean, went down to Egypt, few in number. That is called the Bidui, that is called the confessional. The Hebrew that you see in the paper cut, that you shall take of the first fruits of the ground that you shall bring from the land. The gazelles at the center, right? Because in the book of Daniel, Israel is called Eretz Hatzvi, the land of the gazelles. So I want you to see the dimensionality of the paper cut. I'm gonna hold up the actual piece of art so you can see it in all of its glory, right? The original piece is right, literally done with a Japanese knife. Rabbi, right, on archi archival quality paper. I'm going to stop your uh, share so that it's easier for everyone to see. Okay, great. Thank you, Ross. Okay, the way this was designed was I created the paper cut, and then the paper cut presents itself as a doorway over the land of Israel. Okay, the paper cut becomes a doorway or a gateway into Israel. Right? That's the magic that I wanted you to see here. Right? It's as if we're coming into the land of Israel. Sof ma'aseh The last deed is the first thought. Ultimately, where is this journey out of Egypt going to take us? It's going to take us into the promised land. Right? So that's part of the magic that I wanted you to see. Right? That you understand why it is that I wanted to open the Haggadah with that particular image. I'm going to share screen again to take us further. Right, there's that image of the land of Israel and how it looks, right? The two of them overlaid. This becomes the signature piece of the entire Haggadah, right? Order of the Seder. Okay, here you have an image of all of the steps of the Seder or the Simanim, the signs of the various steps, 
right? They come to 14 or 15 steps, depending on how you count. Right? We begin with Kadesh, Orchatz, Karpas, Yachatz, the breaking of the Matzah, the telling of the story, the washing of the hands, right? Motzi Matzah, right? The blessing over the Matzah, Maror, Korech, Shulchan Arech, Safun, dessert, that's the eating of the afikomen. Barech, the blessing after the meal. Hallel, the psalms of praise. And Nerzah, the concluding passage. Notice what I did here. Um, now, I love, take a look at uh, Rabbi Mates is showing you the actual image in uh, the Beit Midrash there. And if you look at the actual image, you'll see the gold there is actual gold leaf. It's 23 and a half carat gold leaf that was hand applied to the pieces. Right, that's what you see there because I wanted it to be in the tradition of classical Hebrew illumination. And if you look at Hebrew manuscripts, right, you see heavy use of gold leaf. That is why they're called illuminations because it illuminates both the light, the light is reflected off of the manuscript, right? And not only that, but the face of the person viewing it is illuminated as well. What you see here in the center of the page, our, our Seder of the Seder, our order of the Seder, is that the steps of the Seder are woven into the days of creation leading into Shabbat, right? The first day of creation, the separation between light and darkness, right? The second day of creation, and you see Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, and then the Zion, representing the seventh day, Shabbat is woven into right, the Hebrew word Shabbat. I wanted to express through the artwork that the practical steps that we go through during the Seder are not just about right, the, the journey at that moment, but it's woven into the existential creation of the world, the larger order of the world. Right? It's the order of the Seder, it's the order of the world, Right, and Yetziat Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, was part of the divine plan. How different is this night from all other nights? Okay, here, right, we come to the four questions. Right, what's um, so fascinating about this particular text is uh, we learn in the Mishnah that the four questions aren't actually meant to be questions, but they're actually statements or observations that are made with regard to the ritual that we do on the evening of Seder. You're gonna learn more about this. I don't wanna say any more about um, this notion of them being statements uh, because uh, I just wanna whet your appetite for next week when we talk about creative ideas related to the Seder. I'll go more in depth on the four questions and how the original four questions present themselves. For now, what I want you to see is I illuminated the four questions based on each question. Each question is represented by a column so that the statement about matzah, chametz u matzah on the far right side, the green is the statement related to maror, the bitter herb, Right, the third, the blue that you see there is the dipping, right? And then kulanu mesubin, right? The, the whole notion of reclining. Camouflaged in this particular illumination is a statement that appears in the original version of the four questions, but doesn't appear in our version. And that is on all other nights, we eat roasted, boiled, or cooked meat. On this night, only roasted meat. And that's an allusion to the Paschal Lamb, right? Which is at the center of the biblical observance of, of, of Passover. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Okay, one of my favorite illuminations of the entire Haggadah. Okay, so looking at this piece, tell me what you see. Uh, feel free to jump in, take yourself off mute. Who would like to jump in for us? The Hebrew is upside down on the bottom. Excellent, Cheryl. Tell me what you see on the upside down portion. You see upside down uh, Hebrew? Uh, pyramid. Looks like, well, it looks like Hebrew uh, and pyramid. It's upside down. 
Very good. Okay, so we just zoomed in. You see the upside down Hebrew, right? You see the pyramid. Avadim Hayinu, I see right there. Excellent. Very, very good, Cheryl. Okay, you're, you're two steps ahead. <laughs> I can read Hebrew upside down. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so at the very, very bottom, you see Avadim Hayinu, right? This is one of our, our favorite passages that we love to sing, Avadim Hayinu, Hayinu. Right, we, need, we need a chazan on this session to sing for us uh, with a beautiful voice. Okay, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, right? One of the, the, the most famous sections of the Haggadah. So what I did here, as, as Cheryl and others were pointing out, you see the pyramid. What do you see on the pyramid now? Susan, you want to give it a shot? What do you see? I think, I think Barbara. Gonna... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Susan. Oh, what I was going to say is that the Mount Sinai conquered the pyramid, the slavery in Egypt, because the pyramid is upside down. Excellent. And Mount Sinai is standing up straight. And Very so good. that's what I see in the picture. Fantastic. Okay. And, and Barbara also had a comment? So the bottom, the upside down Hebrew looks like hieroglyphics to me. Uh -huh. Very, very beautiful, okay? Um, I had never noticed that, by the way, but as you're saying it, right, I absolutely, I, I begin to see that, okay? In addition, what I want you to see as you look at that pyramid is you see the colors that are draped over the pyramid, right? The colors are meant to remind you of the Ketonet Pasim, the Technicolor dream code of Joseph. What you see in the Hebrew, that Hebrew text that you see calligraphed here, is a midrash that I discovered as I was thinking about this notion of Avadim Hayinu. The midrash teaches that the reason that we recite Avadim Hayinu every year, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, is because we sold our brother Joseph into enslavement. And so God decreed that we had to remind ourselves that we too were slaves in Egypt to atone for the sin of selling our brother Joseph into slavery. Okay, very, very interesting. This is actually a ritual of atonement. And then what do you see around the pyramid? You see shackles of slavery. The shackles that you see here, I'm gonna zoom in on them. The shackles that you see here become the roots of a tree of life growing in front of Mount Sinai. Right? And as uh, you pointed out so beautifully, Susan, right? Sinai is oriented properly. Sinai is what conquers Right, that image of enslavement. And then the Hebrew that you see inscribed here is from the book of Leviticus. And that teaches, right, Ki in Israel, for the children of Israel belong to me. This is God talking, right? Avadim avadaihem, they are my servants. I took them out of the land of Egypt. So what is the narrative? What is the story that I'm telling through the artwork here? The story that I'm conveying is that we transition from being servants of Pharaoh to becoming servants of God. And what is the natural condition for us as Israelites, for us as Jews? It's being free people in the service of God, right? And that is why it's oriented the way it is, right? The colors that you see framing the piece, right? Are meant to be like shards of glass, shards of stained glass, representing the broken fragments of Joseph's family, right? The brokenness that we come from, right? Reminding us of our origins as we journey to this place of freedom. The B'nai Brak episode, right? The Haggadah tells us a story of four rabbis that are seated in B'nai Brak, telling the story Seder evening of Yetziat Mitzrayim, of our exodus from Egypt, Right? until their students come in and they say, Rabbis, the time has come for the recitation of the morning Shema. Right? What does that convey to us? Right? It tells us clearly that the rabbis right, were telling the story. They were having Seder all night until the break of dawn. Right? And then, right, then uh, their, their students come in and say, say, Rabbis, it's time that we recite the Shema, okay? It's a way of 
driving home the message that Seder night, we should immerse ourselves in the story so much so, right, that we should lose our sense of time, right? We should lose our, 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 our sense of what's uh, around us almost, right, as we immerse ourselves in the story of our ancestors. So what I did here is I wanted to weave in all of the different iconography regarding the moment at which we can begin the recitation of the morning Shema. The rabbis come up with a number of definitions for us. My favorite definition, by the way, is they say that the only time that you could begin reciting the morning Shema is when you can see your fellow human being, right, a distance of four arms lengths from you. So you see in the Hebrew, Arba Amot, right? The moment that you can recognize your fellow human being, that's when you can say the Shema. In other words, you have to see the image of God in your fellow human being before you can declare God's oneness. Tchelet, right? This is the blue dye that's woven into the fringes of the tzitzit, right? And the rabbis say that one of the definitions is only when you can distinguish between the white and blue of the fringes of the tzitzit, here, the rabbis give, a, give us a spectrum of colors as they try to define what the tchelet is. By the way, the tchelet, the blue dye of the tzitzit, comes from a snail that is found off of Israel's shores. Right? And then there's this very, very beautiful midrash in which they say that the tchelet, the blue dye, resembles the waters of the sea, which resembles the lower firmament, the upper firmament, and then finally God's throne of glory, which is, which is represented by the strip of gold leaf that you see here. Here on the right side, you see the dancing tzitziot. I call them psychedelic tzitziot, right? Oftentimes when people have uh, looked at this, they say it, it looks like DNA. So that's right, it's the DNA of the Jewish people, okay? Um, and then one last illumination before we take a bit of a break so I could take some questions or reflection, the four children. What I did for my illustration of the four children is I chose a biblical character to represent each of the four children, right? The wise, the wicked, the simple, and the one who doesn't know how to ask. I chose the prophetess Devorah to represent the wise child, King Ahab from the book of Kings and his evil wife, Izebel, Jezebel, they represent the wicked, right? Then Lut, is, uh, is uh, the, the simple, right? And then Adam and Eve are the ones who don't know how to ask. The secret that I wanna share with you about the, this illumination is that this was not the original illumination that I did for the four children. In the original illumination, I had uh, Noah as, the, as uh, the simple and as, um, uh, as the wicked one, I had Jonah. So what happened in the midst of all of this? In the midst of all of this, I unveiled my four children to Dee Dee and Steve and their faces fell to the ground when they took a look at it. Okay, what did I do wrong? What, what was the problem of all of this? Um, it turns out that they, had, uh, they have two grandchildren, Jonah and Noah, and I hit a home run. <laughs> Right? I chose Jonah as the wicked, I chose Noah as the simple, and they said to me very, very politely, they couldn't have their grandchildren opening up the family Haggadah and seeing themselves like this. I did everything I could to dance my way out of it. Uh, I didn't succeed, I had to go back to the drawing board, um, and thank God I was able to find two other appropriate biblical figures that worked well here. Uh, king Ahav is clearly a wicked king as he um, gets rid, uh, he murders Navot and dispossesses him of his vineyard. And Lot, uh, part of what I loved about the story of Lot and why he's a simpleton is because there's a very, very famous story of Avram and Lot in which uh, they come back from the land of Egypt ever after a famine. They're both laden with great wealth and their herdsmen begin fighting with each other. And Abraham magnanimously says to his nephew Lot, the entire land is before us. There's no need for us to fight. You choose your piece of real estate, head in one direction and I will head in the other. 
And Torah tells us, Vayisalat et denav, he lifted up his eyes, Vayart kol kikara yarden, he looked out into the Jordan Valley. Where did he end up? He ended up in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Meaning that he simply judged with his eyes, right? The richness, the wealth that his eyes saw, he didn't think more deeply about the kind of community that he was going to. So I wanna pause for a moment and take any questions or comments that you have before- Matt, there was a question in the chat um, earlier on that's from um, Cheryl that asked about uh, the materials uh, that you use. Cheryl, do you wanna um, share your question? Is she there? No. Yeah, yeah I'm here. Oh, go um, ahead. I asked you a couple of questions. One is that you know, besides the um, the paper cut you showed us, is the rest all painted? And what kind of paint did you use? Great, thank you, Cheryl. So th there are a total of twenty seven pieces in the limited edition portfolio. Twenty seven pieces in, in in the trade edition. Uh, the the majority, twenty four of the twenty seven. Uh, were done in European gouache, opaque watercolors, right, and gold leaf. The paper cuts themselves were done on archival quality paper. There are three paper cuts that are part of the 27. Okay. Um, and those were done with Japanese knives or archival quality pa paper and a whole lot of patience. This is what I use, and I buy the blades by the dozen. But no, no, excuse me, I buy the, I buy the blades by the hundreds. Right. Yes. Uh, the, my background is a, an 11 layer, uh, 14, I'm having trouble today. My that, background is a paper cut, it, Cheryl? Yeah. It's a 14 layer Amazing. paper cut. Amazing. Every Amazing. color is a, is a different layer. Then and, uh, at the bottom, you can see Jerusalem in Hebrew and English. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very beautiful. Magnificent. Thank you. Honor um, to meet can you. anybody oh. tell me why I have lost the, the picture? I only have a black screen now. It's it's um it's we're not sharing any picture right now. Oh, okay. And you, you must be in speaker view, but if not, slide your screen over. You should be okay though. Good. I'll take one or two other questions before we go back into the artwork. Let's see here. Do you work okay. in a separate studio? Like I know you have kids, and I can't imagine like doing all this quality work, and then like kids run through the house with a ball and ink spills on the archival quality paper and the gold leaf gets eaten by the dog. And yeah, no, so I want you to know, Rabbi Mates, that's actually how I did this. I did not have a separate studio space at the time. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I want you to know that most of this was done in uh, our office space in Boca Raton, um, in um, a community called the Cloisters, ironically enough, uh, right near Congregation B'nai Torah. Um, and uh, not only that, but the image of Lot, I'm so happy that your, your camera is focused on the four children right now. The image of Lot, that you, Lot looking over the Jordan Valley. I had my son, um, who was about four at the time, uh, pose for, for me, right? He stood there in front, and, and that's how I ended up drafting that piece. He's now 21. Okay, we're ready to jump back into the art. I have one more question. Do you carefully plan out each piece of art or do you, does it kind of develop as you do it? Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, so this is one of the reasons that these illuminations, right? The 27 took four and a half years to create because it wasn't simply about, right? The painting, right? The graphic design of this. It was about immersing myself in um, mountains. I had piles and piles and piles of, of Haggadot that I was going through, text, Midrash, right, the Torah text. I was looking for authentic inspiration from our tradition. And uh, one of the brachot, one of the blessings that I have working for the Jewish Theological Seminary is that I had access to the rare book room of JTS. Uh, in New York, JTS has the largest collection of rare Hebrew books and manuscripts in the Western Hemisphere, right? Largest collection of the world is at Hebrew University Givat Ram. Uh, second largest collection in the world is at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. And I was able to be given special access and go through classical Haggadot. So every single piece it was a product of both learning as well as design. And thinking of 
how I wanted to convey particular messages in each of those designs. Okay, let's jump back into the artwork. Okay, we leave the four children. Okay, and we go to uh, the, the second of three paper cuts and she stood by us, the he she amda. Okay, um, what is this about the he she amda, she stood by us? The rabbis themselves have a debate over who or what is she that stands by us in every generation. Okay, um, Jessica is showing us uh, the paper cut itself. Um, it's a very, very intricate paper cut. And what I did is I identified uh, four moments, uh, three biblical moments, and then uh, another uh, uh, modern moment um, in, uh, in, in which uh, we wrestle with this notion of God standing by us. So what do you see here? You have Jacob in the house of Lavan with Rachel and Leah. Here you have Amalek, the quintessential enemy of the Israelites and the quintessential enemy of the Jewish people throughout generations. And then we just celebrated Purim. Here's Esther standing with Achashverosh, gazing at the news of Haman. In the final corner here, you see Hatikva in gold leaf with survivors peering over the barbed wire, right? And then she stood by us. Who or what is she that stands by us? Right, the rabbis scour the tradition to understand and they look for a feminine noun in the Hebrew. Is she Torah? Is she the Shekhinah, the, the, the feminine divine presence? Right, or more likely it's Haftacha, it's God's promise that stands by us in every generation. So that's, that's what I narrowed it down to. I wanted it to be in this oval shape, this oval egg shape to convey fragility. Right, and this floats uh, gently against a solid background. Okay, I encourage you to go uh, to Bethel to take a close look at that particular paper cut. Maror, the subtle descent to enslavement. What I did here is I took the text from the first chapter of Exodus. And you see the shape of the leaf of the maror. It's very, very interesting. Um, the rabbis and in the Shulchan Aruch, uh, the 16th century code of Jewish law, we see this debate over what is the best specimen to use for the bitter herb at Seder. Okay, what do we always use for the bitter herb? Horse Something radish. Antique. Horseradish, exactly. We use horseradish, okay, or horseradish root, okay. Grated horseradish, which we know of as crane. Okay, and indeed the rabbis say that the most ideal specimen that we should be using for the bitter herb is not horseradish root, which has this very, very sharp punch to it when we taste and your eyes start tearing and your sinuses are clear, right? But what should we use? They say it's romaine lettuce. And why romaine lettuce? Because romaine lettuce, when you chew it, at first it's sweet to the palate, but the longer you chew it, the more bitter it becomes. That is meant to reflect the pshat, the literal sense of the story that is told in the book of Exodus. Because what happens at the very, very beginning of Exodus, right? We read of Joseph and his brothers coming down, right? They're prolific. They're a very, very successful, prosperous community in the land of their diaspora, right? In Egypt. And then slowly things begin to turn for them but it doesn't happen overnight. Enslavement doesn't happen overnight. So you have the shape of the romaine lettuce. It begins with the story of Joseph and his brothers, right? They come down to procure food, right? They become a successful community. And then, a new king arises over Egypt that doesn't know Joseph. They build the store cities of Pitom and Ramses. Right here, the decree of the Israelites, right? Firstborn males being thrown into the Nile. There is Miriam placing Moshe into the basket. Right, Bat Paro, the daughter of Pharaoh, reaching out to save Moses. Right? And then 
right? The actual enslavement, right? The descent into slavery, right? Notice too, you have the text of the book of Exodus from the first chapter transitioning from light blue to dark blue, conveying that same notion. We weren't enslaved overnight. The slavery happened to a point almost at which we didn't even recognize it was happening to us. There's a wonderful book by Amos Elon called The Pity of It All, which is the history of the Jews of Germany up until the Holocaust, which shows you this notion that um, you know, we look at we you know we look at and at, at German Jews and we wonder to ourselves, you know, why didn't they run? Why didn't they escape? Right? And what this book shows, right, is that the enslavement, the destruction of this community happened so slowly and so gradual, so gradually they didn't even see it coming. They were completely blindsided. Right? Conveys that same notion here. And we cried out, right? This is the third of three paper cuts. Um, uh, Rabbi Mates, if you could go nice and close to this particular paper cut, I just want you to see the dimensionality of, uh, of the paper cut itself. Okay, what did I do here? I went back to the Vidui, the confessional, that uh, the Israelites are enjoined to say when they present their first fruits. Right. My ancestor was a wandering Aramean, and at one point the Israelite says, Vanitzak el Adonai Eloheinu, that we cried out to the Lord our God. So I took this expression of crying out, Vanitzak, 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 and I repeated it numerous times. Every time you see it in this paper cut, it's stylistically unique. Right? And then you get to the middle of the paper cut, if you can pull back for a, a moment, just that great. You see in the middle of the paper cut in the large Hebrew, it says, Vayishma, God heard their cry, Vayizkor, God remembered the covenant, Vayar, God saw their affliction, Vayeda, God knew. This is a direct quote from the second chapter of the book of Exodus, right? And it's immediately after this that God enters history to take the Israelites out of Egypt. What is Vanitzak? That's repeated multiple times. It literally means that the Israelites cried out to God, they prayed. And what I wanted to convey here, I mentioned that it's stylistically unique every time you see it, I wanted it to represent multiple Israelite communities crying out in their own unique voices. The cry ascends heavenward, God hears their cry, and that what, that's what inspires God to enter history, right, to bring about their freedom. Let's uh, go back into the art. Now we're going into the folio page, pages of the plagues. Okay, um, it's quite striking when you look at the makot, when you look at these plagues. If you look at the plagues, they're quite beautiful. You know, one could say it looks like the Katonet Fasim, the Technicolor dream coat of Joseph. Right, but right, you look a bit more closely. What I chose to do, the reason I chose to illustrate the plagues like this, is I want to I wanted to eschew any realistic depictions of the plagues. Right, but every five bands of color represents a different plague. Okay, so um, if we go to the next set here, this is actually the first of the folio pages. Dam, Svardea. Kinim, blood, frogs, lice, right, etc., right, and the plagues play out like that. Every five bands of color represents one plague. And I was playing off of the commentary where there's this very curious part of the Haggadah where the rabbis engage in rabbinic arithmetic and they multiply the plagues over and over again. They say it wasn't just 10 plagues, it was 20 plagues, it was 50 plagues, right? It was 250 plagues, right? Because they want to magnify the miracle of, of, of God's involvement here. It's very, very interesting. So that's what I do with the plagues. The stippling that you see running around the folio 
page is meant to remind you of the wine that you diminish from the cup as we recite the plagues. Why do we diminish the cup of wine? Because the full cup represents joy, right? And so we diminish it to show that our joy is diminished because in the book of Proverbs, it teaches that one should not rejoice at the downfall of one's enemies. And that commentary is woven around the entire folio page, the two pages. The teaching of Rabban Gamliel. Rabban Gamliel teaches three things that we have to mention Seder night. Pesach, Matzah, and Maror. Right? The Paschal Lamb, the unleavened bread, right? and the bitterness of, of slavery. Right? And notice, I call this the evolution of Maror from hardcore slavery to gold's horseradish, right? All those of you who are Northeasterners, right? In, in your roots, you recognize that gold's horseradish. I actually had to ask Mark Gold for permission uh, to use that image. Miriam Hanivia, again, one of my favorite pieces amongst the 27 illuminations, right? Here you see Miriam with her timbrel, right? Illuminated here, you see Miriam with uh, 36 women. I was playing off of the notion of Lamed Vavnikim, or in this case, Lamed Vavnikot. The rabbis teach that in every generation, there are 36 righteous people that sustain the world. They're completely anonymous. We have no idea who they are. And in this particular illumination, I made them all women. Um, and if you get in close there, you'll see that the timbrel is in gold leaf. Um, one of the reasons that I love this illumination so much is that the colors really pop. The colors themselves dance off the page. As you see Miriam dancing and the women dancing, right, the colors are dancing themselves as well. The breath of all life. Right, every breath of life will declare, will, will bless your name, that is God's name. If only our mouths were as full as the waters of the sea or our tongues as the waves of the ocean, etc. Right? Still, we couldn't sufficiently thank you, God. Next year in Jerusalem. Right? Next year in a rebuilt Jerusalem. Right? This illumination is inspired by the story of Choni HaMegel, Choni the circle drawer who sees an elderly man planting uh, a carob tree. And he criticizes that elderly man, says, fool, what are you planting this sapling for? You'll never live to eat of its fruits. And his response is, others planted for me, and now I plant for future generations. So when I thought more deeply about this notion of next year in Jerusalem, what does it mean to us? Right, living in this generation, it seems to me that it means to us that we plant for the future, right? That it's not just about a physical wish of wanting to be here in Jerusalem, but it's also bigger than that, right? It's, it's about a wish for, right, our Jewish future. It's about a wish for the future of humanity, a brighter future for humanity. Who knows one? Right, Echad Mi Odea, and you have a hint for each of the stanzas of Echad Mi Odea. Right? One, is, one is God, two are the tablets of the covenant, three, the patriarchs, four are the matriarchs, five are the books of Torah, six are, are the orders of the Mishnah, etc. Right? You see that the style is very different from the other pieces that we've seen before. Chad Gadia, Chad Gadia. Dizvan Abba Bitre Zuze Chadgadia, only one kid, only one kid that my father bought for two Zuzim. And each of the squares that you, you see here represents one of the stanzas of Chadgadia. And finally, right, we come to right, the ultimate illumination, Hatikva. Okay, I wanted my Haggadah to be woven into the into modern day. And so what did I do? I wanted to Right, bring it into our modern history, the birth, the rebirth of the Jewish people in our homeland, right, the state of Israel. And so calligraphed here, 
you see the national anthem of Israel. And um, part of the beauty of this is that the frame that you see scrolled around the piece is based on a ketuba from the 19th century from Ferrara, Italy, uh, that was actually sitting in the collection of um, Dick Levy, who we spoke about last week. He was the one that commissioned the Moss Agata. Dick and B. Levy had a very, very expansive collection of rare illuminated Kitubot marriage contracts. And I particularly loved this one from Ferrara, Italy. So I went over to Dick's home in East Boca. I sat down with my, uh, my archival paper with my paints and began drawing, sketching, painting the frame. So this is modeled off of that particular ketuba because I wanted to convey the particular message of a promise, right? Of a wedding between the Jewish people and God or a renewal of vows as it were, right? That this is God remembering God's promise to the Jewish people of the return to our homeland in the modern state um, of, of Israel. So uh, as I wrap up, um, I, uh, I want to guide you to my website if you want to learn more about the Lovell Haggadah, www.rabbimattberkowitz.com. You're welcome to take a peek. You can see other pieces of, of art there as well. And I also want you to know about this book, uh, which is entitled Signs and Wonders, 100 Haggadah Masterpieces uh, by Adam Cohen, who is a a professor of, um, of art and Judaic studies at University of Toronto. Um, this is um, a truly magnificent book and I'm proud to share with you that I made the cut. Um, both um, the Moss Haggadah from last week and, and, and my Haggadah um, are in this very, very beautiful book and um, I encourage you to, to get your hands on this as well. So um, I'm happy to take any questions, comments. Yes. Do you, get, oh, do you use this Haggadah yourself at your Seder? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, uh, yes, this, this Haggadah is around our Seder. But I do want to say, in addition to the Lovell Haggadah, uh, we have a mountain of other Haggadot in the center of the table. Um, I love variety. I love diversity. I love hearing other voices, you know, weaving creative ideas uh, every year, bringing new Haggadot to the table, uh, showing different images from David's Haggadah. So um, yes, this, this, is, this is the central Haggadah that's used, but we, we love to use uh, other pieces as well. Any other questions or comments, feel free to unmute yourself. Hi, it's Elizabeth. Hi, Matt, how are you? Thank you for coming back, Elizabeth, for the oh, encore. My pleasure. I really enjoyed it. And I was wondering you. if in your Haggadah you have this was wonderful um, back backstory explanation of your design. Do you have something like that in your Haggadah? What what things mean, interpretations, or is it straight Haggadah? Absolutely. It's all in there. The 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 beauty of the Lovell Haggadah is that. Um, you have all of the explanations that I gave. Um, there's even an appendix that goes through um, the, the, um, the illuminations are woven throughout um, and you have um, short descriptions of the various illuminations opposite them. And if you're interested, then you go to the, the, the back and you can go deeper where you have essays on each of the pieces. Oh, uh, but in addition, you've got, you know, uh, questions, creative ideas that are sprinkled throughout. Um, definitely worth getting your hands on. And one quick question. Is this a hardcover and soft cover? I noticed. Yes. 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 There's both hardcover and soft cover. Um, soft cover is available from Amazon. Um, hardcover is av available from me. Uh, okay. And if you order from me, I'm happy to sign. Um, but uh, they're both editions. I'll also mention to you that I worked on a very, very interesting Haggadah project last year uh, that is very, very fun to use second night of Seder, and that is called the Express Haggadah. Uh -huh. And the Express Haggadah is printed as one, like 11 by 14 piece. Um, and it's very cool, it's very fresh. 
You could take a look just when you go to Google, type in the Express Haggadah and it will take you right to the website. And the other secret that I'll share with you, if, if uh, you don't order the hard copy, um, uh, next week, uh, there's going to be a digital version that will be available for those of you that are having Zoom seders that you can incorporate this Express Haggadah. What's nice about it is Kishmo Kenhu, just as its name, so too is its essence. Um, it goes through the, the, all the steps of the Haggadah, but it does it quickly. And um, if you have an audience that really means business and needs to move, then this is what you should use. Okay. I don't you. know if anyone has any questions. We're almost out of time. Um, I, I'm going to share this with our staff and leadership because, you know, I was a tour guide in Israel and we always had used the site and, and to see these up close and personal. I've seen bits here and there, but just to hear it from you has been unbelievable. When Bethel is open again to all of us, please come to this room. There's a beautiful booklet. Um, Susan Podolsky hung this uh, exhibit so beautifully. And um, it's just been a joy today. I'm, I'm sad for all of you not being able to be here, but, but you will. You will one day soon. Matt, thank you so much. Do you want to give us a preview of next week too? Sure, sure. Next week, our topic is going to be uh, creative ideas to enrich your Seder. So it's going to be very, very uh, practically oriented. And um, you should definitely tune in. We're going to have great fun together. Um, you'll also receive um, a booklet from me about uh, that you can print out. Uh, cut out pieces to use Seder night. So um, you'll really enjoy it. The sparks are going to fly. And um, <laughs> I look forward. Uh, I'm glad I don't have to say goodbye. Thank you so we, much. Rabbi we Nate, do as well. And all of you. Thank you, Ross, our amazing producer for being with us. Thank you, everyone who's tuning in today. Have a great week and take care. Take care. Thank Shabbat you. shalom. Thank you. Be well. Beautiful. All the best.